Hi, this is Kurt Repencheck with National Parks Traveler. I'm here in Rocky Mountain National Park to kick off a series on beaver in the national park system. And what's going on are many units of the Park Service in the western half of the United States are turning to beaver to help restore the habitat to what it once was. This landscape behind me used to be very tall willow, willow groves, willow trees, willow stands, and it was all marshy ground because beavers, just over here to my right, is the Colorado River, beavers would dam that up and it would force the water across this landscape and make it kind of a mushy ecosystem, a marshy ecosystem, which really was great for willow stands. In the 1970s, the state brought the moose in, not into the Rocky Mountain National Park, but outside the park to the north. But the, the moose loved it here. They multiplied incredibly. Within five years of returning moose or bringing moose into Colorado, the state actually started a, a hunting season for moose. That's how rapidly they were growing. The moose came across this landscape. They loved the willow. They wiped out the willow. And that was a real detriment to the landscape. Disclosures are part of the National Park Elk and Vegetation Management Plan. And that plan has a 20 year life cycle. So when these exclosures were built, the idea was to keep the exclosures in place for 20 years and then take them out. But I think now people start to realize, well, if we take them out, we're going to go back to zero again. So moose were introduced to Colorado in the 1970s. They weren't here naturally. There's no records of moose being in Colorado, you know, in, in any of the historic records. Since there's no hunting allowed, the moose population has really increased. So if you go back for thousands of years, this valley was a giant willow stand that supported lots of different animals, including beavers and, and passerine birds and amphibians and all kinds of animals. And just really in the last uh, 30 or 40 years, the, the populations of ungulates have gotten so high that they have just smash these willows right to the ground. And these willows last, they live a long time. I mean, some of these willows could be several hundred years old. And they, they predate, uh, you know, Caucasian settlement of the West. And uh, you know, they've been here and they're a, a part of the legacy of this landscape. The reason beavers are important is because they build dams on rivers, they raise the water table, they flood areas and spread the water out and they create the wetlands that really uh, form this whole valley. So the beavers need willows for food, but they also use willows for dam building material. And you can tell that the condition of the willows here today makes it impossible for a beaver to make a living in this part of this valley. We've gone from an ecosystem that we really call a, a, a willow beaver system to something that we now call an elk grassland. And when the beavers disappear and the hydrologic effects of the beavers go away, the landscape dries up and you see the landscape <coughs> turning from what we'll see in a minute from this, this wet area with willows and native grasses and sedges to something that looks like this. Most of these plants that are here are European pasture species that were introduced for hay crops uh, in the area. And so this, this area is becoming kind of a, a, a meadow, a dry, meadow that's more similar to what you'd find in Central Europe than what you should naturally find in Rocky Mountain National Park. But they're great for elk. The elk love these grasses and these clovers. And so the elk beating down the beavers have helped engineer this system that's now kind of a meadow that's suitable for them. And the beavers are trying to fight back and create a wetland system that's suitable for them. So there's this crazy tension between the ungulates and the beavers and the ungulates are definitely winning. Moose in the summer, 90% of their diet is willow. So they are really hammering things. And the park is doing a, a study of moose now and there's, I wouldn't doubt that there's 100 or 200 moose in this valley. They eat probably about 50 pounds of willow dry forage every day. And if you then, you know, kind of focus that out a bit, um, yeah, the. They, they, the moose have had a huge effect. There were beaver dams here and active beavers and tall willows throughout this whole area. Yeah, it's just, just during the time that I've worked in this park, the whole thing has changed. <coughs> you know, the mountain men, yeah. the famous mountain men, yeah, they really had a big effect, but naturally the beavers came back. There's also a big beaver colony in, the, in along the Fall River in Horseshoe Park. Mm -hmm. There are beavers in Wild Basin. Okay. And beavers don't need a gigantic area of willows. Four acres 
of really healthy tall willow stands is enough to maintain a beaver population indefinitely, at least one beaver family. So these exposures are plenty big to have successful beavers, and we're seeing that now on the, on the east side. Ten years ago, this looked like that. Wow. All you need is to reduce the, uh, the mouths on these willows, and they're perfectly capable in today's climate. And even without beavers here raising the, the water table and creating an abundance of water for the willows. So last summer, we did have a beaver or beavers in here, and they started making some dams. They got um, blown out with spring uh, melt this, this year. year. Um, but we hope they'll build them again later summer, fall. Uh, and there ha had not been a beaver since 2004. Um, and David actually saw that with his own eyes in 2004 mm -hmm. and the flooding that it, that it caused. Um, and you may have heard the, a lot of research on beavered landscapes in terms of you know, the flooding uh, being able to help withstand, withstand drought. So even during drought, the landscape keeps wet. And that also helps in terms of wildfires that it's a lot less flammable. So when the fire moves in, which is natural, right? But you end up with these green islands in areas that have a beavered landscape. So there's lots of benefits um, to this kind of re the restoration we're after. A lot of this sediment was deposited behind the beaver dam that created this high terrace right here. And this, this bare sediment is really important for uh, willow establishment. So willow produce little tiny seeds. And the seeds are dispersed by wind, as you know. If you have screens on your windows, you know what cottonwood uh, seeds are like. But willows are the same, just tiny, tiny little seeds. They can't go dormant. The so, other thing, when, so the, when the beavers build a dam like this, they were diverting a lot of the water out of the channel and out onto the floodplain. And if there's a lot of beavers and a lot of willows, then another beaver will capture that water and divert it all the way across. And all of those things we came across out there are old beaver dams. And so just from one big main stem, main stem dam, you could have 15 or 20 or 30 other dams out on the floodplain that are supported by this water. Mm -hmm. And I would bet in fall when the river level is really low and they need to create a winter food cache, mm -hmm. they'll build this dam again. Mm -hmm. Probably a lot bigger and taller.